education and faculty of campus. I welcome all of us to this interactive session and to start with commendation, first of all. And I know the reason why I want to start with commendation to these two faculties. It's uh, not even coincidental joining you people at this interaction, but for me to use it as a platform to express my happiness with the two faculties. Because actually, this is the last stage of interaction I'm going to have with all the faculties. I've gone to other faculties and I've already expressed my concern about certain issues which came to my notice or which on my own as the chief executive of this university I took time to find out about certain issues. Uh, in other faculties there are a lot of uh, rotten issues which uh, started addressing but I want to say here that for these two faculties there are no any negative issues at all. So because uh, it's a system and where things have been done rightly. We should say it boldly for those that are doing the right thing to continue to do the right thing. And so that those that want to start doing any wrong thing should think twice. I know what I'm handling with other faculties. Even though I'm going to mention some of them here, but the purpose of our meeting here is for me to relay some messages which are already delivered to Senate. The first Senate we had this year, that of January, which I chaired. I started by narrating our progress so far, particularly under my administration for the past three years. And I mentioned that the usual thing is not for me to come and mention to us that uh, I've achieved this, I've achieved that. My concern is about what are those things that are pending? And who are those responsible to carry them out? And I've expressed that to the Senate, that there are a lot of uh, issues at the faculty and departmental level that we need to start working on very fast. Because we have a guideline, we have a roadmap, which we develop for ourselves, particularly under this administration. I do not just start work without planning. I brought a blueprint and that blueprint was well submitted. I presented it to council, I presented it to senate, I presented it to congregation. And with the hope that all of us will be on the same page to use the content of that blueprint to serve the system. And this blueprint I've also mentioned several times. I did not just sit down 
alone to be jealous. I was able to contact those that are experienced more than myself to give me some ideas after explaining to them some areas of peculiarity of this university and that guided me to put the group in together. And when I was presenting the blueprint, I was bold enough to see that the blueprint has no any issue that people can point at as any of inadequacy. Well, because I experienced professors, I experienced vice chancellors. Some of them were vice chancellor twice, some three times. In fact, one of them was vice chancellor for almost 26 years. And that was why I was bold enough to present the blueprint to any stakeholder of this university. And I've not seen where anybody will say, look, there's nothing we can achieve with this or that. And since I have no I have been consistent in the use of that blueprint. I have not allowed anybody to distract me. There was no any distraction at all. And to also let you know that the Office of Vice Chancellor used that blueprint with other stakeholders of this university for all the activities we have been conducting. And that's why whatever we have achieved, I've always referred to it as a collective achievement because most of the activities have been carried out in this university are based on committee system. So I use committee very well and effectively to see that everybody participated in the use of this blueprint. But normally when you are in, in a joint, it's always good for you to, to sometimes to stop and assess yourself or the system. Particularly in a university, analysis, research, seeking for information, are uh, things that are uh, our responsibility, whatever we are doing. So based on the assessment so far, because after three years, I have to carry the blueprints, go line by line, paragraph by paragraph, page by page, what have we done collectively from the blueprints. And when I say collectively, whatever we have done from that blueprint is not me really alone that have done it. Because I use many committees to do that. And as I'm talking today, we have covered up almost over 80% of what is done in that blueprint. And I challenge everybody to go and carry that blueprint and look at it line by line, page by page, do your assessments, and you find out that over 80% of what is in that blueprint are covered. And university is always about content, about ethics, about capacity and infrastructure. And all is contained in that blueprint. But by my observation, the 20% remaining are things that cannot be done at the Office of Diversity. And that is the reason why I listed those things and I took it to the Senate. 
and I mentioned it to them, and you all know that yes, all those things mentioned are not what Office of Vice Chancellor can do. It has to be at the Department of Faculty level. And usually when we host Senate meetings, faculties and departments are represented because deans are representing their faculties. HODs are representing their departments. And whatever we discuss at the Senate meeting, what I expect every department to do is to have a brief that we take to their departmental board. And the dean should also have a brief to take to the faculty board. There should be no any Senate meeting held without any message going to individuals, academic staff, or examiner at the faculty or departments. But what I observe in this university, our deans and the agencies are not doing that. Sometimes we leave the Senate, whatever information given that the Senate doesn't reach each academic staff, because those are the field workers, those are the ones to carry out whatever Senate decision is not being carried out by deans or the agencies. Those that are carrying out the decision of Senate are the academic staff, the examiner, the examiners, post examiner at the faculty or department level. So whatever we discuss as Senate and should go back to them. And also, whatever that is the problem or concern, observations of the party or faculty should also come back to Senate to the deans or HODs. And sometimes you go to Senate, you ask faculty, no any issue to present. I've seen many, many of the Senate meetings. You call in of faculty, no report, no report. There's no how you will be carrying out activity for a month, the faculty or department that you tell me that there's no report. But then people can go to Senate with their emotional interest. Then somebody will go with personal interest or with some kind of emotion, thinking that should be what should guide the Senate. But Senate is not for any personal interest, it's not for any individual emotion, it's for the system. And all of us must understand that. So it is very important our HODs and things to note this. But because this message I'm having here today, that the 20 percent of what is remaining in the blueprints are the activities for departments and the faculties. I felt I should take that responsibility upon myself to go to every faculty and tell them. We have a blueprint, we have been using the blueprint, we have covered 80%, the remaining 20% is for you people at the departmental and faculty level. Because I want to be sure that the message reach every academic staff in every faculty. And by the time I do that, we are going to have a team to follow up, a monitoring team to follow up, so that at the end, we have a period to evaluate what we have been doing at our departmental and faculty level. And this may be a better opportunity also for some of us to also learn one or two things about university administration, about faculty administration, or about the departmental administration. And uh, I want to plead with you that I will take at least more than one hour to address you on some of the things. I know most of the faculty are going to, I think, at least I took two hours to address them on the issues based on this 20% matter that is remaining. And I'm doing that not for myself, not for any individual, but for the system. And I'm doing that because, again, this is also another opportunity 
for some of the, our younger ones that are coming up that do not know more about the university system to learn about the university system and to know the management of the university have to go with learning that we do is not uh, issue about knowledge alone. You can be knowledgeable and not intelligent. You can be knowledgeable and not wise. You can use knowledge to have accurate decision, but your decision, your decision may not be a wise decision. So all this has implication on the system. And it has implication on every individual as we grow in our career. Because having knowledge is a different thing. You can express your knowledge at any point in time by identifying problems in the system. But those that are intelligent are those that use the knowledge to solve problems. If you are knowledgeable and you cannot solve problems in the, in the system, you are not intelligent. So you will have to learn about this. And also, some of us that one day will get into management position, you also know the difference between taking accurate decision and wise decision. When you are taking accurate decision, you are using only your knowledge. The information given to you, that is what you use to take your decision. And whatever decision you take, which is accurate, can give you sufficient results today. But if you apply such package again tomorrow, it will fail you. The reason is because you did not factor in the future. Any decision you want to take, you should factor in the future. It's when you factor in future in your decision making that you are going to be taking wise decisions. There are many people that take decisions today and tomorrow they will regret of the decision they took today. Why? Because the decision they took was not a wise one. And all this is very important to management that we should, we should know. So and that's the reason why I need to make some preliminaries so that some of us should not think that some messages given here are not uh, necessary. It may not be necessary for you to make, but if you can take notes, you find out that it will be necessary for you tomorrow, particularly the younger ones that are coming, because I look at everybody here as a potential head of department potential HODs and potential vice chancellor. I know some years back, I used to be head of the department. I used to also be dean of a faculty. I did not know that time that I would be a vice chancellor. But because right from the beginning, I've given a very key interest in the university system. And that is what is helping me today. And that is why whenever I'm going to say anything about the university system, I don't look at anybody's face. I talk out of my experience. And it helps me a lot. And again, to also know, maybe for some of us, this is not my first time of being a vice chancellor. I've been a vice chancellor that started in university from the start. And that is even the most difficult thing to do. Amen. If you are a vice chancellor that starts university from the scratch, you will know what it takes to start the university. So wherever I see anybody say this is a familiar vice of the university, I know what the person has gone to. So if you are a vice chancellor in the university that's already established, your work is straightforward. The most important thing put in place 
all the necessary policy document and planning document and use it. So please, some of us, this may be a forum for lesson to take and to learn about the institution. And we should all know that whatever we are doing in the university is a collective effort. And we should continue to work together so that our system can uh, lead good results. When the system needs good results, it's for all of us. It's not for any individual. And issues that I want to mention as follows. The 20% that all the departments and faculties should work on. One, academic monitoring. Academic monitoring. We want to know how punctual, how regular are our academic staff to lectures, and what is the quality of their teaching. Who is checking that? It's very important because we have failed in doing this. I want to tell you that the students are already doing this. The responsibility of the department, the responsibility of the faculty, because we have failed in doing this, monitoring how regular our lecturers are to class, how punctual are they to class, and what is the quality of teaching. Why I say that students have taken this responsibility? There was all the ISA program, which we call the speak up program for students. And this is to bring students into the management of the university so that they can also have right to raise concern, observation about how the university is being managed. The day we convey this program to the students, that very day we resolve that there should be suggestion box in some locations so that students that have concern about the university, even about the vice chancellor, whatever the vice chancellor is saying that's wrong. If they like, they should not write their name. If they like, they write their name. They should throw their comments in that suggestion box. And our station is starting in our office that every week or two, two weeks, they go around to collect all the information in that box and bring it to our office. Another officer in the office will now compile everything. And I go to those comments of students, one after the other. In fact, on this academic monitoring, students have said a lot. And they have even mentioned names of some academic staff. There are even some of them, they will even mention the number of times they come to class in the semester. Some of them even describe the quality of teaching of some of the, the lecturers. And you can see this is what the faculty management or the department management should do. And when I look at it and I do not see any concern from faculty and department, I created professors for this university. And I gave them seven terms of reference. One of the terms of reference is to monitor academic activities. And this academic monitoring is one of them. In fact, they have a subcommittee handling this. And what I expect that subcommittee to do, those professors should distribute the timetable to themselves and assign <coughs> classes randomly. The professor can go, okay, I'll, today I will check this course to know who is the lecturer and how punctual is that lecturer. 
I will sit within the class to listen to that lecture. And by the time they do that, they will come together, compile their reports. Where they have observation, they will present as states. Dens and HODs are there. Even if you didn't mention the name of the lecturer, just say so so course, called so so day. The lecturer came 30 minutes late, and the content of the teaching, as a professor, anybody that is teaching, you should know what is the nature of the delivery. And by the time they present that to Senate, the HOD of that department will take notes. The team will take notes. And when they go back, they are going to discuss that to correct. And this is the only way we can be improving in our quality of teaching. But how many of the folks are doing this? So we are not doing that. And it is high time that our deans and HOD should sit up to do this. You can develop your own model of monitoring. It mustn't be in a, in a particular manner. You can look for a way to do that. So that the system will know that, yes, somebody is monitoring what we are doing. Any system where there is no any monitoring screen, there can never be improvement. People will just think, oh, yes, I'm already doing the right thing. So we need to put this in place. So because we are not doing that, the students are doing it for us. And it's embarrassing for students to be calling name of lecturer. In the other faculty that I went, I you know, after interacting with them like this, I called some of the lecturers from office and I addressed them. I addressed them. Even though when I was interacting with them and their faculty, various faculty, I told them that, look, I don't want to embarrass you by calling your name and say, Dr. Dish, Mr. Dish, stand up. Because it's not even about the punctuality, regularity, or the quality of teaching. There are other activities that sexual harassment, collecting money from students. And I called some of the lecturers, I presented some evidence to them. Some confessed, and I said this should be the last. We are not here to destroy anybody's future. But if students have started coming out to mention name of lecturers, that this is what they are doing, then you should know that we are not monitoring ourselves. So, the Department of Faculty need to do something about this. Very, very important. Secondly, Academic Forum for Innovation and Development. Academic Forum for Innovation and Development. We have seen cases where professors are not accessible to the younger ones because of ego. The moments of people become professor, they go and buy ego. And you don't know that when you use your professorship with ego, one day that professorship will become in the ability to and it will become in the ability to the system. But if you carry your professorship with humility, that your professor will become asset to yourself and to the system. But then, but because we don't want people to be carrying their profession with ego in the system, we want, if anybody that is carrying profession with ego, you can't mentor anybody. Nobody mentor with ego. So, and that is the reason why we feel we should bring a scheme where the younger academic and senior academic can come together to share ideas on research matters, or collaborative matters, or community development services, to share ideas on how to attract grants, 
and you say a department or faculty can bring one professor to two lecturers, two uh, uh, team le assistant lecturers together, and you should have schedule where they will meet to discuss some academic issues. It should be a forum for mentoring the younger ones. And the reason why we say we should do this is because normally we are people who want to serve the system and people who want to grow others. You should be ready to assist the younger one to grow. And informally, the senior one and the younger one can come together and be related and will be developing. But these days, it's not happening. And that's why it's on the university, they bring out a formal system to bring the senior one and the younger one together. And again, there are cases where some younger ones also are not easy to be mentored. Particularly with the kind of system we are running in Nigeria. Somebody we call is a secretary in ASU. You are lecturer one or lecturer two. Because you are secretary in ASU. You don't have respect for professor. They consider that ASU position as paramount. I've said this even at the council at the ASU Congress. And I've said it in the, the Faculty of Social Science, where the ASU German is, and I told him, this is some of the problem some of you the ASU officials have. You are lecturer one, because you are secretary of ASU or ASU chairman, you don't see a professor with respect. You go to some university, some of those younger ones that take ASU on their head, they don't go. The other ASU will be pressing them. They cannot go, they can't go at all to be pressing them. Some of them, they are not, they will be coming more shorter than if you are glad they are Because they carry out so too much. And it's supposed not to be so. Yes, if you go out to actual acti activity, express it. When you are outside, out something, you go to your department, respect those that are your seniors. And this is the reason why, formally, we should bring this thing into place. So that if you are as a second and you are a lecturer too, you are a teaching assistant to somebody in your faculty or department. And it's about system. It's not about the issue of uh, saying welfare matter, which is the paramount thing for us, welfare matter. They don't discuss how to raise productivity in the system. They don't discuss how to fight poverty because some of them are members of parties. They don't discuss uh, exam and practice in ASU. Because we, we are keeping our responsibility away. The most important thing is to fight government, fight management. And that is why we are not getting heavy. We resist anything we see use a cake method of pursuing our benefits. You go to a meeting, they will give you bottled water, you will finish the meeting, you leave it there. Uh, you, you say you are having a meeting. You, are you having a meeting with your enemy? Are you seeing where somebody will meet him with his enemy? Because that's what it means. You go to a meeting and you serve water, and uh, by the time you finish, you, all of you will give uh, the things as that is as policy, as as person. And what are we achieving with that? It's because we are not respecting the system. The system cannot respect us. So, academic forum for innovation and development is very important. Every faculty should have it. You can have it at faculty level, you can have it at departmental level, depending on the number of academic staff that are in place. Academic mentorship is related to this. But mentoring scheme is also very important. In the university system, there is no activity that somebody cannot be mentored. No activity. Today, if we, are, we appoint anybody as an assistant lecturer, we are looking for to him to go and teach directly. Nobody guide him what to teach, how slow to teach. And that is why we have a problem the system. 
But where we want a system to work with good quality, every younger academic must be attached to the senior academic. If you have to teach undergraduates, you must be mentored on how to teach undergraduates. If you have to teach postgraduate, you must be mentored to teach postgraduates. Some of us pass through that. I was a, a teaching assistant to a senior lecturer before I start teaching undergraduates. I was a teaching assistant to a professor before I start teaching postgraduates. I did not just go to class and start teaching. Sometimes I would go to my boss to carry his file, following the class. By the time I keep the file, I would sit in the middle of the student and listen to the way he's teaching. And when you give assignment, give tests, you ask him to go and develop marking skin. And when I come to him, he will show me, no, this is what, this is this, this is how to structure marking skin, this is how to allocate marks, this. I can tell you there are some people that they will rise up to professor level, they can't structure marking skin. It's a fact. In fact, some people don't even know what is marking skin. They, they, they mark off head. They mark off head. And there's no examination that you don't have marking skin. Any examination, you should have marking skin, how to allocate mark to each point. But these days, people will just keep a script of students and start drawing all sorts of things with red barrel. And at the end, you just award mark. No following of marking skin. In fact, even to market of the final year students, it happened in National Asian University when somebody marked final year student uh, scripts without marking skin. And he had been doing that for many years, nobody knows. Until when they, they, they had a very strict external examiner. That one comes, he says, okay, the first thing he wants, he wants to see the attendance of those that uh, wrote the exam. When they gave him, you look at the total number, you now count the scripts, short of about 23. You now call the attention of the that these scripts are not complete. So, you have to call the attention of the lecturer, and I think something must have happened with those 23. But they went ahead to look, yet they didn't get complete scripts. The man now suspected that something was going on. He now asked for the marking scheme, no marking scheme. Then he started to look at how the scripts were marked. He now found out that scores were just allocated. No any proper guideline to mark. At the end, he wrote a terrible report to the vice chancellor. And the vice chancellor has to constitute a committee. I chair that committee. But for us to know that some people, uh, no matter how bad the case is, they are not remorseful. He came, I was telling the committee, he said, look, for the past five years, this is the way I've been working. But because some people want to be mischievous, this is and that. So at the end, we wrote, and uh, his appointment was terminated. So this is for us to know that structural marking scheme is very important. If you don't have it and you mark your scripts like that, it's an offense. It's an offense. So this is because you know mentor. To teach university you must mentor. To research you must be mentor. For you to be head of department, you must be mentor. To be dean, you must be mentor. And that's why I'm saying sometimes you may be lucky to be head duty, to be dean, to be deputy vice chancellor, to be vice chancellor. If you are not mentor to get to that position, you still have some other way to improve on what you lack. You have to do wider consultation. You should consult widely. 
and where you cannot consult, officially is there in the university the use committee system. The use committee system. But there are people that cannot even use committee. They will say, oh, the use committee system it will delay you, it will delay your work. But it depends on who, what kind of committee are you constituting. Your committee will be strategic, but be dynamic. Dynamic in the sense that it's not your friends that you should look for and say they are member of the committee. You know the kind of result they will bring to you. What you want is what they will bring to you. Or you are constituting a committee, you did not know the nature of the stakeholders in the system. And I've said it, I think when I was presenting a paper in one of the faculty, in this university, or any university you can, you can talk of, if you carry out analysis of the system properly, there are three categories of stakeholders. You have a proactive, and they are 10%. Even in this university, they are 10%. And for me, I know them, and I've been using them very effectively. You have the active group, they are 30%. And then you have the passive. When you say proactive, these are the people that even they, before the problem exists, they've already developed strategy to solve that problem. Those are the proactive. They don't wait for the problem to come. They have their own strategy to address it. Those are the proactive. And for those that are active, once there is problem, they will be busy to search for strategy to solve it. Those are the active. But the passive one, there is a problem, they don't care. They don't care to solve. And that passive again, you should, you should note, there are three groups. Because when you say passive are 60%, the first group get their 20. 20%. If there is any problem, they will be looking at the problem. It doesn't concern them. Then the other group, they will create problem. They will create problem. They are 20%. Then the third group in that passive group again is that they will create problem and also play victim of that problem. They are the ones that create problem, but they will be playing with other people. So if you want to constitute a committee and you are not careful, you pick your chairman of that committee, passive person. You pick all the members, passive, the secretary, passive. Don't have any results. Don't have results. And that is why you have to be very careful the way you construct. That's why I say your committee should be dynamic. Let the chairman be a proactive person. Get two or one to be active. Surround them with uh, the person. They can't be, they can't do anything. Because the proactive person knows where he's going. Even before coming to a meeting, he has strategized how he's going to conduct his meeting. But if you have the passive to be chairman, by the time they come, they will, instead of them to be discussing ideas, they will leave their ideas aside and become individuals. Or discussing events. And you know those that discuss ideas are the people with strong mind. Those that discuss events are the people with weak mind or narrow mind. And those that discuss individual are the people with fixed mind. They are here in the system. But if you are somebody, a chief executive, if you cannot identify this kind of people in the system, you are going to fail. You are going to fail. And that is why, as a vice chancellor, you are different from any other chief executive or other parastatus. As a vice chancellor, a professor, you are an academic person. You're supposed to conduct research. You are the one to go and look for information. Don't just sit down, I think you are a commissioner or minister, people will bring the information to you. And whatever information they will bring to you, 80% of it is for you to work in your favor. So as a vice chancellor, I don't just sit in my office and uh, what things going on, allow anyone to bring information to me. I, I can look for information on anybody. 
I'm a researcher. I'm a chief executive of the university. If I'm no longer a vice chancellor, I should continue to do my research. Even while you are a vice chancellor, you should be doing your research. And that is the reason why, as a chief executive in the university, you have to live wise. Because you must work with every stakeholder in the system. It's just like saying you must eat with everybody. There's nobody that is not an asset in this university. But the most important thing is, if you want to eat with everybody, you should get a set of spoons. Those that are short and those that are long. There are some people that you should eat with a short spoon. And some other people you eat as well, not spoon. You may be in your room, you should be outside, then use your spoon to eat. <laughs> but you have to eat with everybody. Everybody is a stable like you. Whether you are that you know, your is not your own. Whoever is here, consider the person assets, and you must do with them. But the most important is the level of involvement in strategic issues should not be the same for all the stakeholders you have. So, and this is the reason why we say committee system, if you are not mentored and you have your HOD, you are dean, you are vice chancellor. If you use committee system alone, you are okay. Because what committee gives you is the wisdom. What mentorship gives you is wisdom. What consultation will give you is wisdom. And in management, wisdom is the most important thing. Because you have to use information and wisdom together if you really want to take a wise decision. So, mentorship particularly academic mentorship, is very important for us. So, mentoring, mentoring scheme needs to be in place. It must, it must be the same from faculty to, the, to faculty. There, there is a way you can do it. And I know in some faculty or department they are doing it, but they are not looking at the mentorship implication in that. And that is why they don't know, they, don't, they are not assessing the results out of it. I've seen many departments where the peer, senior, and younger one to teach the course. There is mentoring going on there. But some are not really looking at the, that. Because the senior ones become more lazy. They will just carry, go and teach. They attach somebody to you. You're supposed to sit down, structure the course outline, look at the content, go to the class with the person, introduce the, 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 the course. If you want to free yourself from the teaching of the course, why they should go? Allow that person to teach in your presence while you sit down to watch. After the class, you call into the office, tell him some of your observation. And you take correction, and that, that's how you, you, you grow the person. But the moment you peer a younger one, a senior one, you just go and teach this. You don't bother. So, departments, faculty need to look at what kind of uh, mentoring scheme they want to bring into place. And it's very important, and it is not just for only academics. I've expressed it to the registry, and registr registrar has already developed a scheme for its own people. And I'm looking for a day to also follow up on that, to know how far they have gone with that. Schedule of duties. Every staff in the university must have schedule of duties, whether they're teaching staff or not teaching staff. And when we say schedule of duty, it's not the same for all the ranks. Schedule of duty of a professor is not the same as that of assistant lecturer. In a system where we know what we are doing, it's not the same. And uh, because I've not seen any clear schedule of duty for academics now in this university, I prepared a proposal to Senate, which I presented. And I think at the end, I have the Senate to forward it to the Committee of Things and Director. The chairperson is here. 
so that by the time we finalize and send it approve it, we should start implementing the requirement them. Which I'm doubt I have I'm doubting if we are implementing it. Then the next thing that can come out of this schedule of duty is the work plans. Work plans. If you have schedule of duty, that will guide you on how to prepare your work plan. Nobody go to his office without having a plan of what he's going to do. Either on a daily basis, or weekly basis, or monthly basis. But we have many people in the university system that don't have work plan. As an academic side, we have a lot of things to do in the area of teaching, in the area of research, in the area of community service. And you should be able to reflect that in the work plan on a weekly basis. But because nobody is monitoring what we do, we find out that we go to faculty or department, staff are not having work plan. Somebody will just wake up from his house, come to office, and uh, sit down. If he has nothing to do, open his bigger phone and start watching films. Small time, another person will enter, they will take a seat and start discussing the videos. Maybe for some hours. And those are the only things they know. Some will even sit down, their time for lecture will pass, they don't know. So, and uh, you go to non teaching start sometimes. You see, somebody will just come eating in the office after finish eating, take some time to sleep, and nobody's watching. <laughs> nobody's watching. It's only when you come, you come and see a peel of uh, the amount on the table, you see you know, all this or something on the floor. <laughs> and I've told you this, I've said it several times. Schedule of duty. Because I took them by surprise, I just came out and said, Oh, Stanley, what is your schedule of duty? They put me, don't even know what is schedule of duty. Talk less of having work plan. So, nobody's watching all this. And there's, we, we don't say you come to office, you don't have rest, you have to be working. No. But there should be something you should give attention to on daily basis. And it is that your work plan that your supervisor need to look at. Because there are two things we can take from that. We can assess you or what you are doing. And based on that assessment, we can know your area of deficiency. And we can arrange for training to eliminate that area of deficiency. But when there is no schedule of duty, no work plan, what are you going to assess about the performance of staff? How are you going to identify any of deficiency that will guide you to organize training for the staff? Because in any organization, there should be retain training. And the training should not just be anything, calling people come and train for this. There must be something that is deficient you want to train somebody for. But when there is no any work plan, in fact, every year we do annual appraisal. You see supervisors calling people 80%, 90%, 70%. And you go there, you find a problem. If you say, well, what, why is this problem? Say, the social person is responsible. If you carry the, the assessment of that person, it's called 80%. And that person is a problem in the unit, but it's calling 80%. Why? Because we are, we, there's no any guides on how we are saying. But if there's one plan, you'll be able to score. If the work plan is used on a monthly basis, you score on a monthly basis. Although, when it comes to the final decision, the score you have there should be what should be reflected. But we are not doing all these things. And in fact, that has taken us to the next one, which is key performance indicator. And this was even indicated in the reports of presidential administration panel to this university that this university from the central up to today has no key performance indicators. If you want to assess this university now, what are the indicators we have to do to say we are assessing the performance of this university? We don't have. 
And if we have, is it documented anywhere? And we are using it. If you want to assess any faculty, how do you compare one faculty to the other? If you want to uh, assess departments, how do you know which department is performing better to the faculty? And there is no competition because there is no any key performance indicator among the, 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 the assess our performance. This was indicated, and uh, what I did was to constitute a committee to prepare the key performance indicators for this university. The committee submitted their reports yesterday, and I said we have to look for input from other units. I've minuted to DBC ACAD to call all the deans of faculties, they should make their input. I've also minuted to DBC Research and Partnership to call all the directors of centers, let them make their input. By the time we finish, they will take it to Senate and approve it, and then that is what we are going to be using. And by the time we are using it, there should be a, a kind of implication for whatever any faculty score. For whatever any faculty score. But until we are set that key performance indicator before we cannot decide on how are we going to use it. And when we are using it, what will be the results of that using it? If a faculty should get below certain percentage, what will we do to them? If they get above certain percentage, what will we do to them? Until we agree with that key performance indicator before we can work on that. Capacity building is another thing. I know at the central level we are already doing it. In fact, that was the reason why I created Staff Productivity Promotion Unit to organize training. And as I'm talking now, there is no category of staff in this university that has not been trained in one way or the other. But what I want is this capacity building should not just be led at the center. There are a lot of training issues at the departmental level or faculty level. So even seminar is part of the capacity building. There should be seminar on how to identify areas of community service. There will be seminar on how research should be conducted. For some of us in the social science, you can even prepare a seminar on how to structure questionnaire. So that the younger ones should be picking some essential issues in research. There should be seminar even on issue around quality of teaching. All these are part of capacity building that we are expecting from the faculty or department. So, which main department can arrange for training for their staff. You can even bring a resource person from outside. If you suggest and say, we want one social person from social organization, to come and train your staff on social issues as a resource person. If the department has no fund, if your proposal is a very genuine one, the university will, will fund it. But the vice chancellor cannot identify key issues in a department and they are organizing training for you. And that is why it's the department that you know, you know your staff, you are interacting with them, you know their capacity. And you have to build the capacity upon what they have. But we don't expect it's only the training that is organized at the center, where we bring people from different, and that one will serve for general. But there are peculiar issues. If somebody is in, for example, mathematics, there are certain issues in the, that you can bring a resource person from somewhere to come and talk to the junior ones, or the entire faculty on issues related to teaching of mathematics, or teaching of physics, and other things like that. But we left the training issue to the center. University management, 
But we they want to now say, okay, where there are deficiencies, summit. And what we can only do at the center is to look at the general issue. Where we can say those in different departments will come together and train on common issues. But department for department, there are peculiar cases that require training which department needs to look into and organize training for their staff. Quality assurance. Our approach always when there is accreditation. Accreditation of programs, you now see HODs and uh, the staff in the department will be hitting head of the wall as if heaven will fall. Why? Because our you know, tradition is, uh, is approaching. That's when they will be frequenting the office of the vice chancellor. Some of them will be bringing lists of something that they themselves they never use some of the items to train them. Somebody brought in this uh, when they were preparing for application, and I looked at one item, almost 300 million. <laughs> and I called him. I said, you have PhD in that? He said, yes, okay. From your PSC to your PhD, for me, I'm very sure nobody has trained me with this machine. You are talking about. He said, but you see, they need to this. I said, okay. The only thing you do is no university has all the things they need to train their students. And that's why we talk about collaboration. Go around and see other agencies that have some of the things we don't have. For us, we pick what we feel we can release fund for. But some other things that we cannot, if you go around any organization within Nassau states where they have those facilities identified, we can write them, we want to collaborate with them, we will sign MOU with them, and then we take our students there to use the facility to train them and we give evidence. And the most important thing in accreditation is for you to show evidence that yes, you have facilities that are accessible to students to use for the training. What you can do that also. So in the college of mixing some programs that came, I said, look, go to Dash. There are certain facilities they have there that we don't have list them, we we'll write to them, let us engage with them you know, through MOU. And that is what we did. And we presented some programs for accreditation to that means, and we got them. So there is no need for us to wait until accreditation comes before we start pushing for certainty. And that is the reason why we say there should be quality assurance reports for every program, every semester. In fact, I also presented a paper on this to Senate. And I say, Committee of Deans and Directors should go and fine tune and bring to Senate finally for approval. And I don't know whether any uh, faculty have started using that. In fact, I even gave instruction that all the HODs should submit quality assurance reports to DAP, and they should do that every semester for all their programs. And the essence of this is for us to know how are we progressing for every program. And at any point in time, we should be able to say, oh, we are ready for accreditation. Or when accreditation is coming, we know which of the program we need more of our resources. Because we are already keeping track of the progress of the programs. If you are submitting or you are compiling or preparing quality assurance reports. But we are not doing that. So quality assurance reports is also very important. And when we say quality assurance, it entails so many things. The issue of programs will come in. The issue of personnel will come in. The issue of facilities will come in. The issue of uh, books in the library who come in, the issue of environment who come in, how neat is your environment. The issue of management style also come in. What kind of management style are you using as HOD in your, 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 your department? 
Is it a, a one man business? As some people would always do. When they are literally, they will feel nobody really enter that office again. Mm. Until the day, they will be surprised when they are not in that office, another person will be there. And some of the documents you are trying to hide, it will be on the depth of the messenger. So management style, committee system, particularly in the university, even at the departmental level, we work on committee system. And that is what brings in accountability and transparency. There should be record of anything we are doing. So all these are part of the quality assurance. Even the training, how many training have you conducted for your staff? How many training has your, um, your staff gone for? What, are, what type of the training? What is the source of fund for the training? All these things, I've, I've, I've highlighted them in that paper presented to Senate, which I said, I don't want my idea to see as if I'm pushing my idea to Senate. On two of these and directors should see what I'm fine to it. Remove what you feel is not necessary. Bring in whatever is necessary. Let us have a document that will be guiding us on how to keep quality assurance reports. So it's also very important. And when we say quality assurance, it's not for the department, it's for program. In the department, you can have up to three programs. And that is why NUC, when they go for accreditation, they don't go for accreditation on departments, mm -hmm. it's on programs. And that's why when we are keeping quality assurance report, it's also be by program. Uploading of profiles. I've said this several times. We need to upload profiles of our university, of our faculties, of our centers, of our department, and even in the regions. Now, sometimes we'll see that we'll see all sorts of results coming out of our university ranking. It's the content that the university has in its uh, profile or portal or website that they have this and use it to rank the university. The ranking agency, they don't go to university by university and they travel and come to national uh, university or come to federal university of Latvia and be counting how many buildings you have or how many lecturers you have or how beautiful your building are. Nobody do that for your ranking. It's what you have in your website. They will have this and use to rank you. And what you have as your content, including in your the result outputs from individual lecturers, the number of uh, the, the, the postgraduate uh, students you have graduated, the number of research grants you earn, and what are the number of community services you have uh, you know, carried out. So all these things matters, and we have a lot of information about what individuals have done, about what department and faculty have done, but they are not on our website. Anybody who does go and invest the little they have, and will say, oh, even a university that uh, does come yesterday, because they have a lot, the website will say they are better than you. And that is the reason why we need to upload our profiles. And I've already mandated the DVC Research and Partnership to do that along with our MIS director, and I know they are almost finalizing on this. Because we, I sat down with them, we developed templates for the university, developed templates for faculty, for center and departments. And we said they should send this to all the department and faculty and centers so that they can provide this information for upload. And I know we are making progress on that. But for individuals also, we need to also work on that one. And it's very important. Today, if you go to any organization and say you want to collaborate with them, the moment you give your data, as you are going out, they will browse and check whether you are featuring. And it happened to us once when 
you are not the director and uh, the DBC, you signed a partners we went to Abuja to seek for collaboration with an, a, a company. And the man collected a letter and uh, immediately they went out. He browsed Federal University of uh, Latvia and checked for that center. Nothing about that center. Let's say these people are not existing and they say they want to collaborate. Somebody that is not existing, how do you collaborate? He, he particularly came to want me to tell me this. So, so center want to collaborate with company. But he checked on the website, there is no, no name of that uh, center. So he shows something is wrong. And that is the reason why we feel we need to upload. Because anywhere today, you say you want to you know, collaborate with anybody. You are extending letter of partnership with that person. If the organization is, is a, you know, a very good one, what they will do is to make sure they check your website. What do you have here? In fact, if you don't even really have much that you have done, they should see the name of your center, the objective of your center, your mandates, your strategic stakeholders, and in fact, I've even seen some of our center here, some have even conducted some activities. There should be pictures or some kind of uh, text to express what we have done. Because even if you have not done anything, the organization you are approaching should be able to read your objectives. And they should be able to see one of the objectives that is related to their own activities that they can come in. But when they just look at it, there's nothing maybe about the name, maybe the name of the center is not there. Talk less on looking at the objective. So this is why we have to work on that. Collaboration, we sometimes we say partnership, linkages or networking. It's also another thing. Uh, I've seen cases where we are not giving very good attention to this. Within the department, you can collaborate. Between departments in the same faculty, you can collaborate. Between one department in the faculty and the department in another faculty, you can collaborate. You can collaborate between faculty and faculty. All university and other university. But when we look at the way we are handling things these days, collaboration is not giving any good uh, attention. And this is the reason why we have created so many centers in this university. So that people from different faculty can come together to address a particular issue. For example, if we say Center for Energy Studies, the moment somebody hears the word energy, they'll be referring to physics or people in engineering. And who told you that the problem of energy cannot also be addressed in economics or sociology? So, people in science, people in the faculty of computing, people in the faculty of English, people in the faculty of social sciences, they can come together and carry out result on energy matter. And that is what we are talking about collaboration. Because the problem of energy, particularly in this country today, is not a one direction issue. There are economic aspects of it, there are social issues in it, there are scientific issues in it. All these things have to come together. And it is also because of this that this university also created the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Partnership. Just to make sure that we open wider door for collaboration among ourselves within and between this university and other agencies or institutions. So we need to use this opportunity to widen the scope of our knowledge. Because if somebody is in uh, science, doesn't mean that he has nothing to learn from somebody in social science. And when it comes to the issue of facilities, you can share facilities between your own faculty and another faculty. It's also part of collaboration. 
In fact, we have been facing a lot of uh, problems where you see some faculty will just hold on to a particular classroom and say, no, this is, this is for us. They don't want to share with anybody. Even when they are not using that place and another faculty needed, they will say, no, it's already allocated for That is not collaboration. In fact, even Harvard University collaborates, and that is why the word collaboration is common to in every university you go. No university has all the facilities that you need to train your students. No university in the world. And that's why they have to collaborate. When you come even within the same university, people will say, no, no, you can't do this. It's for the social program. Even in the same department, people will stick to a particular classroom or maybe office that nobody can use except their own, their own department. So we should learn how to collaborate. And that is where, when I look at the way some of us complain about shortage of facilities, particularly in this system here. Yes, it's something to recognize, it's something to look into. We need to make sure we, we, we make offices and some facilities available adequately to train our students. But where we are not having enough to do that, we need to allow some flexibility in the way we, we attend to our problems. And I do share my experience when I was the Dean of Faculty of Agri in National University. The Faculty of Agri, when they established it, we don't have even one building. We were using facility in College of uh, Agriculture. And that, 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 so uh, to the extent that whenever we want to structure our timetable, we make sure that the two institutions come together. We structure it in such a way that when we'll be using the, the classroom or the country, they are not having anything to hand. Our timetable officers sit together to make sure we do this. And then we'll, the management of college and that of faculty will come together to approve it. And we don't have any problem. And in fact, even when I was there, I used those facilities to present all the programs in my faculty for accreditation. I got full accreditation. When my faculty here we are complaining, we don't have um, uh, animal farm. I said, say, look, go to college of agri. Where I was there, we use the college of agri farm. Then they don't even have their own animal uh, farm in the habits around the home side here. And they gave us a place we use it for our own, for, to train our students. And when the accreditation team comes, there is nothing they can do other than to accept it. Because there are evidences that yes, we take our students there to train them. So, but the case is sometimes we want to compare our institution. We said, please, somebody came in front of me to start talking in the ABU, this and that. And I said, look, all my training was in ABU. And I worked nine years in ABU. If you are talking of faculty of agri there and IA, if you remove IA completely, what we have here is better than what we did in faculty of agri in So nobody can tell me about that. And I said, in fact, I've gone for accreditation in many universities, whether private, state, and, uh, and uh, federal, as a team member and as a chairman of, uh, of the team. Some of the accreditation team, when they come here, what we have here, they don't have in their university. But somebody will just come and think you want to harass you, ask them, what do you have in your university? When I was in the, the chairman of this of a group in Nigeria University, there is no university in Nigeria that offer and that I didn't go to. And I know their strength. And there is no any dean of faculty of that will come to my university and say, in my university, I will tell you, when I was chairman of this of a in Nigeria University, I know the university better than you. So we should not be 
fighting with the, you know, because sometimes some of us are being carried away. You see a professor with gray hair come and sit down and you introduce him. You look and say, oh, we have before when you go to your faculty to, to see what you have. Be bold to tell people how you are training your students. Where you have facility that are not on campus, elsewhere, take them there. Our first forestry department in the we have the forest far away. And we, when we come and say, where is your uh, forestry plantation? We have to take them there. And that one we wrote an agreement with the state government to, to, to allow to be using that for, for, to train our students. So we cannot say everything we need to train our students must be on this campus, must not be within your faculty. It cannot be elsewhere. The most important thing is to have a structured mechanism in place that will allow your students to have access to those things with proper documentation. And then you can present it even during accreditation. And that is part of the, uh, the collaboration we are talking about. So it is when we have this belief that we are going to make things easy for ourselves. But the moment we are insisting, you must get everything work. In fact, all over the world today is knowledge economy. It's not resource economy any longer. If you have little resource, you can use your knowledge to transform into so many things. You can use it to transform into so many opportunities. That is not the economy. But there are cases where some people just want to have the resource. If you have the resource without the knowledge, that resource will not be useful. You can have all the equipment you want. And if you did not train people on how to handle that, they will be lying down. The first thing for us to know, are we having that knowledge to handle whatever that is elsewhere, or that we want to bring into this place. So let us also emphasize the area of collaboration. And uh, collaboration should also not be left in the hand of uh, university management. Faculty, department should also look for a, a way of bringing in uh, activities through collaboration. Because every program that you see in this university, every program, Go and sit and list all the programs. There is no program in this university that don't have agency or institution outside there that have activity that is related to your program. If there is none, there is no need for you to train anybody. So how much of efforts have we made to reach out to those agencies that have activity related to the program we are running? And that is part of the area of uh, collaboration first. But most of all, we just sit down, it's for us to just carry our notes, go to class, teach, and now so. The next is resource mobilization, which is also similar to this. We need to mobilize resources. And when we say resources, it's not always about money. It's also about ideas. You can bring any individual to come and share his idea with you people in your faculty or in departments. So the issue of uh, resource mobilization is also very important. I know in this university we have resource mobilization units. I will have the resource mobilization committee. And I know the day I even commissioned the resource mobilization committee, I also presented a paper here where we stated what should be the function of that resource mobilization committee, what should they do? How will they develop what we call the stakeholder mapping? And to use it in identifying strategic stakeholders that they can be engaged to mobilize resources for the university. The same thing faculty or department can do. Let's talk to core values. I know when I started my administration, I think for the first one year, most of the occasion, 
I emphasize core values. I emphasize core values. That the core values of this are university. Integrity, innovation, and excellence. It's not just written for us to read. It's for us to respond to. Any activity we are conducting, we have to respond to these three words. When we say values, these are things that are acceptable all over the world. And we have so many values. And we have chosen three. And we say these are the core for this university. Core values. But how many of us are responding to this? If you are teaching, you have to respond to this core values. If you are kind of research, you need to respond to core values. If you are any marking, when we are marking students' skill. Because when you say integrity, doing what is right, even when no one is seeing you. That is integrity. How many of us are responding to core values when we are teaching? Because teaching with high piety, it means you are responding to the core values. When students carry out or maybe took exam and you want to mark their skills, the first thing you have their marking scheme, you use your marking scheme strictly to mark their skills. That is integrity. But I've just mentioned now that some people don't even use marking scheme. Some are well marks anyhow. Is that integrity? And when we come to research, there are a lot of dubious issues now in research. Somebody could conduct research, and because a theory has said the coefficient must be positive, and when you finish your analysis that is negative, you will be trying to twist it, it will be positive, since the theory has said it. You will be forcing it to adjust until it becomes positive. Who told you that it has to be positive? Because the theory has said it's positive, then it has to be positive. When if if you see that your research work bring out something negative instead of positive, first of all go back and look at all the procedure from the beginning. Once you didn't see any mistake, then that is another source of research. You have to find out why that negative. But not for you now to say oh it's, it's negative. You now start to be adjusting some figures or you remove some. Some people are doing that. That is not integrity. Because if you want to follow integrity, let the results of your research, if it is well conducted, let it be another source of research. And you talk of uh, innovation. Any teaching you want to do, you must, you must carry out research. You must bring in new ideas. Some of us have been teaching one course maybe for many years, and the content remained the same. The content remained the same. In fact, some lecturers uh, file, you see it so black, because of our overuse. The content, the paper inside, because of hands has already turned it off, everything will turn brown. No additional information. No additional information. To the extent that your students, the moment you enter class, some of them will be sleeping. They know what you want to teach. They know that this one is not bringing any new thing. That they control themselves. They collect notes of the, those that, that, that they are senior. They make innovation. If you want to work or respond to the cover of this university, you should be updating yourself in your discipline. You should bring in new ideas. There are no definition of any concept that doesn't change day in, day out. And how are we updating ourselves? And again, excellence is for you to be unique. And you can only be unique when you work hard. So, the core value of the university has already given us direction. If you are to respond to it, you don't have any problem. But how many of us sit down, whatever we are doing, we look at this cover and go, oh, how are we going to respond to this, in whatever we are doing? Even when you are in office alone, this cover should be guiding you. If you don't have a plate that contains you, go and put it in the office so that 
where you are, you are sitting now, make sure you are not going contrary to, to the problem. So it's very important. The institution has come back to, and it's even expected that every individual should have his own problem. You should have your problem with me as an individual. Because if you don't have, you have at least allowed yourself to be controlled by others. And the moment people start controlling you, you should know they will only control you to what will benefit them. And before you know it, they must have used you and dumped you. So, and because we don't want anybody to be used against this university, that's why we have the covenant. And the covenant of this university is to enable us to comply to all rules and regulations of the system. The government is saying these are rules and regulations of the system. Then the integrity in it is for you to obey those. So, our response to covenant is another thing that need to be obeyed at all levels. And I know the Office of the Vice Chancellor has always demonstrated this. Whatever you see that we are doing in this university, just pick any activity. You see this one inside. Integrity, innovation, and excellence. And uh, it's promoting us promoting us. I know I attended one inaugural lecture of a colleague uh, who is also my senior in ABU. And uh, when we went to the DC office, the secretary of the committee of vice chancellor came and was telling the VC that I like the way you package the booklet of this uh, convocation lecture. And the VC pointed to me and said, I copied it from him. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank our chairman of uh, the Moral Lectures Institute, Professor Wode, because the VC of Makwadi came here once to attend the Nagoya Lecture of a uh, staff that was promoted here, but now our tenure staff. And our own policy has stated that you can be a professor of any university. If you are here as a tenure staff, you can present your Nagoya Lecture. The only thing is, your university where you are promoted, the vice chancellor should be here to co chair the vice chancellor of this university. And most universities have been complying, following our. So he came here and the booklets he had, the next inaugural lecture, they were to. He in now included some of the things he saw in our. So this is part of the thing we are saying. And he really appreciates the way we are doing uh, things here. So, and that's why I'm commending our chairman of uh, the Nagoya Lecture Series. And we are already moving fine the way I think uh, the way we are doing our Nagoya Lecture here. Uh, anybody that comes here, they are not a team, they need to learn from us. Even that day, the Vice Chancellor came and uh, we are to do the procession. And he was now saying, ah, no, the, the number of lecturer should be in my own front. I said, no, we have a guideline. And our guideline is saying, you have to be in front of the leader, the main of whoever is the last yes. principal officer. That's one mistake. So quickly, I corrected him that we are this. So we have a policy, we have a guideline. So anybody that comes here, you should. And again, there was a time when one of um, the vice chancellor came here and we had to do procession to the Nagoya lecture in the Euro. And I told him, this is, you go and wait for us. You can't be on the line. That's our policy. And he has to quickly go and enter and wait for us. So, and this is how the system should be. It's not about any individual. It's not about your relationship with somebody. It's about system. So whatever your system has laid down, you should follow it. And this part of the technique we are saying. It's not when you are relating with this, you will be waving principle. It's not so. So, uh, core value, very important. Participation in e-learning activities. Now we have the directorate of e-learning. And uh, the faculty or departments should use this opportunity. 
You can mobilize resources by running some certificate courses, diploma courses online. Many universities have been doing that, and it's very important that you sit down at the departmental level, structure our certain training that is going to help to even feature your department, you know, all over the world. And uh, we know when we created the directory of e-learning, we did it to solve a problem. And now it has come to stay to serve the system in all ramifications. Because when we had to uh, admit two set of hundred levels, those we are admitted in 2021 and those that we are admitted in 2022. For each of these sets, we have 3,500. And if we are to bring 7,000 students together into this event for 100 level alone, it's going to be a very difficult task. So that's the reason why we quickly say those that are admitted, those that are admitted through 2021 should do their lecture physical. While those that came through 2022 admission should go virtual. And we quickly <coughs> created the directorate of uh, open, distance, and e -level. And that directorate now is solving a lot of problems for us. So, and I think even the PG school now they are key in. So, we want a situation where every department we can look for a program, whether one or two. And uh, they are with the directorate, and they will give you a platform for you to run some of this uh, program online as a source of revenue to your uh, faculty or department. The use of policy and planning documents. That is one major thing that we are about to bring out, maybe be one of these for a congregation. We are going to bring all these policy documents or planning document and obey them so that uh, we start to use them. And by the time we have made that, the university continues to actually run itself. The uh, university is not about any individual. A day must not be on ground before faculty should function. The, the vice chancellor must not be on ground before the uh, university should run. In fact, that is the reason why these days I don't even chair Senate and we don't miss any of our Senate. Since we have three deputy vice chancellors, if I'm so busy, uh, I allow them to go and chair the Senate. So, because I don't have any personal interest in what we discuss as Senate, whatever Senate says we should do and come to office, that's what I will approve. So, it is only when you have any personal interest. That you say you don't want any other person to chair the Senate. I say, look, no, it's even good for the DBCs to know all members of the Senate. Because it's only when you are chairing a, a meeting that you will now understand uh, different people. What Mr. A will say when DBC A is chair and it will be different from what he will say when the CP is chair and And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity for the DBCs to know those that are in the And for the, the Senate to also know them and know their capacity. So, and that's the essence why we should allow uh, you know, the DBCs to also chair and But there are cases where some investors don't even say it regularly. Why? Because certain things vice chancellor don't want to take to, to say it because of personal interest. Or when they go to say it, it's the vice chancellor that will discuss that matter to the end and finalize. There are cases where some people don't even want to go against anything. Approve, approve. But when they go out saying that's the way it's running, say, why can't you say it when you right? there? So, and that's why sometimes I exempt myself from people should not say, oh, because the VC is there, say anything. Say anything. Even when I'm there, say anything. In fact, there are cases where some vice chancellor don't recruit professors because of sales. 
They will not want anybody to come and challenge them in the Senate. And not knowing that you can learn from others. And that's the only way. It is when you, you, you open yourself to challenge, let people challenge you. You will learn a lot. But when you want to come to say things and uh, all you want is your view, you must be accepted. Your view must be accepted. So uh, it's very important that uh, policy documents, when they are in place, for example, in Senate now we have our standing order. You know, we have standing order in Senate. And uh, anybody is free to say, look, we are going out of order, come back to this and that. So when the system has policy, anybody can be picked to manage the system. It's only when there is no policy that you not start finding problems to manage the system. So it's very important that uh, Please, by the time all these documents will be ready, I think I have about 10 of them that are already uh, sent out for printing. We'll look for one of the uh, events to unveil them, and all of us will now start using them. I must not be on ground for the rest of the itself. And for me, if today, saying that, oh, we have achieved 80% of what is my, what is in my blueprint, if today I'm exiting this office, I'm already satisfied. Today, because I know I'm already leaving the university. Except those that have not used this opportunity to learn about the university. But that is not my problem. Because for me, I'm always thinking beyond this environment, thinking beyond today. And if you are the type that is thinking beyond the environment you are, and thinking beyond the present time, you don't have any problem with anybody. Because you have a brighter future. So I'm not here to be a local champion. I'm thinking that uh, it's not a revolution. So if today they say, look, leave. When I was in the country, I spent three years. And exactly what happened here, I, I, I my blueprint 80% of what is here was covered in three years. That's why the university, when they announced we should leave, I took one week to stay back to celebrate my exit. <laughs> I didn't get along with anybody. Most of my colleagues, even those that are uh, the, the, the support to finish their dinner on Monday and they, you know, they force them to leave on Friday, they left in anger. <laughs> and me that I we have two years. I said to help with them, I have to wait and celebrate my success before I leave. I will use the university resources for organized party for everybody to In fact, the day of my I have the video up to today. We started the, 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 the handing over ceremony from 8. We did not finish on 6 o'clock. Yes. After the special management meeting, we did special senate meeting. I took the new vice chancellor to every offices, and I took him also to all the projects that are ongoing. And my security people organized parade for me at the gates. <laughs> so there is no bitterness in the new office. There is no bitterness in the new office. If you know what you have achieved, if you know what you have achieved, so. Why some people, even at the meeting when I was expressing my joy of living, some people were crying, some people were happy. And those that were happy, myself and them were on the same page. Because I'm also happy I'm resisting, I've succeeded. To achieve 80% of what is in your plan. And anybody that goes here today, we, the, the moment you are here, you call Federal University of Africa, you first of all call my name. And the person that's took over from me. At the meeting, I told him that let me tell you I'm the founder of this university. First happiness for me is that the history of this university, if on the first page, if my name didn't come number one on the first line, on the first paragraph, my name will appear. Or before they finish the first page, my name will appear. 
And whatever glory you, you, you have in your tenor, I share in it. You might have the foundation. So there is no bitterness in the name of us. And that's why I'm saying that when all these documents are in place, it's not that it's not compulsory for me to be on ground to monitor what's going in the university. Anybody can serve an acting vice chancellor and continue with uh, the running of the university. So, and that's the same thing I did, even when I was hateful, when I was dead. In fact, in National Science University, it remained seven months for me to finish my internship the seventh time. But my target was to have full accreditation for all the programs of faculty. And immediately I achieved that. I went to the training for sabbatical. And when I got it, I went to the vice and said, no, you are still a dean. And I said, what I want to achieve for the faculty is to get full accreditation for the programs. And I've got in it. And my deputy dean today, Professor Ajayi, some of us going, if I say A, or if I say A in your presence and I'm not there to ask him, the same thing you say. So which means it's the same faculty we are with. And the same reason to you are with me. Ajayi finished my seven, seven months of my time before he now took over, you know, as the proper thing also. So there's nothing you leave in office and you feel people like you don't want to, to do it with. So it's because sometimes we don't have plan. If you have plan and you are following this, you are monitoring your achievements, there's nothing to be better about. The moment you can assess yourself, so this is the percentage of what I've covered. If I if if up to now, I, I, I'm covering like 40. That's, that's where I should, I should be that, oh, I've not done enough. But if I cover 80%, if today the federal government feel they want the same as uh, the people in Russia to announce also, I will arrange two people who eat a lot before I go. <laughs> <laughs> I will call for anybody that say, come and cook, let everybody eat. And that is why I don't expect any investigator to call me back to celebrate me. Because whatever celebration they are going to do is not going to be up to what I did. <laughs> so, and because we obey police document to the end, I didn't show any personal interest. Students so call program. We have here at the center where I say students are already using suggestion box to send message to the office of the vice chancellor. There is need for the department of faculty to also have a speaker program for, for their students. As a dean, whether you want to make it level by level, depending on the population of the student, you can have staff, student follow. Allow students to express themselves. Let them express their concern about how the, the, the faculty is being run and the department being run. And it will also enable you to have opportunity to correct certain impression in the students. But that what many faculty and departments have started this, particularly even through this orientation they are organizing. This is what we expect. It's a speaker program for students. Call them and as dean, don't be afraid of telling the student if there is anything that the dean of faculty is doing that is not right. They should say it. If you yourself say that, let's see any staff that will say students should not say anything that they are doing wrong. All of us, we can learn people from these students. They can point out certain issues and it will be part of our management and to improve, improve the system. So the speaker program should not be left in the hand of the university management alone. At the departmental level, faculty level, we need to also put in place that, even if it is going to be what we call staff student forum at the departmental level or faculty level. Let us look for an avenue where students can raise their own concern. There are many things going on. Collecting money from students unnecessary. 
Last week, I invited three heavenly persons where we discussed some kind of information I was uh, getting about their uh, departments. Sexual harassment, exploiting students, and the way somebody would just come from class to class maybe two times, and one student to, to, to read for exam, you don't come two times and then you say, okay, take this note and now come. And you are being paid your salary. So all this we discuss. And the, the way people are presenting those matter to me about those departments, I've been getting from three-man committee to go and compile this of those people to bring. But I've told the, 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 the HODs to go to those departments and first of all tell them that these are the information reaching the office of the vice chancellor. And their names will come. I know many names that have uh, received the one of the speaker program where students may co co complain. In fact, even my, my faculty of civil and home, faculty of admin, the small faculty that is just coming up. Yeah. So I'm not that and I, I saw that I was ashamed of it. And I've seen the faculty that uh, on this matter they are needs, no issue. Faculty of education, faculty of uh, computing. In, in fact, if not because we don't have offices, I would have said you give me one office in your <laughs> So uh speak up program. Please for students at the departmental level, faculty level is very important. Respect for rules and regulation is another very important issue. We should not take this thing light. We know all of us we have different status in this environment. But despite our status, when there are rules and regulation in place, we should obey it. Because if you are HOD, there are rules and regulations in place you are not obeying, it will be very difficult for you to control the younger ones and the students. And it's very important we should tell ourselves the truth. Sometimes people want the, uh, don't want us to say the truth, but you know, Truth is just like when you take a stick and uh, beat a mud, it will splash. Even the person that uh, beat that mud is not exempted. That is, the, that is the truth, that is the work of the truth. So, and that is why whenever there are rules and regulations, let us not exempt ourselves. We should all obey it. I know of a time when I gathered, I think, uh, the professors here, yeah? and I uh, was talking about obeying rules and regulations. And I gave an example of our ID cards, that we should hand our ID cards. It's not about com uh, convenience, it's about compliance. Somebody came to my office and said, oh, uh, I'm having an allergic when I have this. And I said, okay, it's a university. We can do a research for you. Or you go to directors of research and uh, get it off. They will look for a way of how to get solution to that. You are allergic something. But you must hand it. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the situation is not that we just brought this. There are a lot of security reports we got. And we are not like this. And when we are not like this, we say, okay, because some people may want to show status difference with the students. We know something, we cannot be wearing the same thing with uh, students. We differentiate the problem. And it's very important we should obey this. Because in the daytime, anybody can come to this campus, go around to survey the environment. And in the night, they can come to, to do whatever they want to do. But the moment we see you, 
you are not handling this. We know that you are not a stakeholder in this university. And some people just want to disobey the rule, not because of anything. But when you go, there are certain places you go, particularly for conference, they will put this on your neck. Sure. And even the, the, the ID card will be wider than this. You see some will cover the whole chest. <laughs> and yet, somebody will not say, if you are allergic, you will carry it on the chest and you will be in a you will proud. But you come to this university, feeling bad about hanging, what is there in that? We are saying it because all the students are watching us. And there are certain things that if they didn't even tell us, we should know that if we do, we are abusing ourselves. Anybody that is not obeying rules and regulations, no matter how little, that person is abusing himself. And what is the person telling himself that I'm not responsible? But if somebody opens his mouth and says, you, you are not responsible, you will fight. But ultimately, with your attitude, you have shown it. Now, abuse yourself. Without anybody opening his mouth to abuse you. That is the, the issue with rules and regulation. Anybody that is not obeying rules and regulation, no matter how they do, forget about the status of the person. What is telling the public, I'm not responsible. And it's too bad. In an academic environment, for us to feel as if uh, we are both everybody. And that's why I say, look, as, a, as dean or as a HOD, you can't even control your students if you are not handling your own. Because if you are handling your own, that's when you'll be able to, if you are not, and you want to control the students. The student himself will look at you. Within him, he must have already abused you. Look at this is responsible. You did not hang you said this one is telling you to hang. You know, sometimes it's not until somebody talks out. Somebody can look at you and abuse you with his mind. Just because of your attitude. So please, we should not abuse ourselves in a system like this is an organized system. We should not always be demonstrating primitivity. If anybody that works against rules and regulations in an organized system is a primitive person, let us be civilized. Let us be civilized. The next is um, digitization of all journal articles or all journal publications that are not online. These days, most of the ranking system we are seeing is because those articles that our staff are having are visible online. But there are some old professors that the articles are not online. And the quality of those articles, they are far, far better than some of those articles that are online. Far, far better. So, but because they are not visible online, nobody is citing them. So we are looking for a way to digitize all those old journal publications so that we can also send them online. We are already talking with uh, the company handling our e-learning because it's the same company that digitizes staff and student records. And when we digitize staff and student records, we saw a lot of uh, issues and we have corrected a lot of issues and uh, things are becoming more easier for us now to trace matter of our student and staff. So digitization is going to be extended to communications, particularly those ones that are not uh, online, so that uh, we can make them visible to the public and people can be cited. And I want to use the opportunity to also advise some of us that we are supervising our students. We should make sure we encourage them to reference us. You are supervising the students. The subject matter student is conducting research on. You have publication in them. 
and your student is not referencing. Yes. But they will go and reference somebody in America or UK. And uh, that referencing they did is projecting the image of those universities and those people there. But you that you are laboring in supervising the student, they are ignoring your publication. So the more your student also reference you, the more other people will reference your work. So we have to encourage them to be referencing uh, our work because it's going to improve the visibility of our work also. It's very important we take note of this. The two faculties. Now this is the end of all those things that are saying or still the 20 percent that department and faculty need to work. These two faculty, we are giving attention to issues that are challenges to the faculty. I know office space, particularly faculty building. Faculty of education, you actually have your building coming up. And uh, even though the, the issue we have, uh, we are already resolving it because there was commission in a bill which we traced to original document in Telephone and we were able to write back to Telephone and they send their team here, they look at the project, they look at the document and they agree that yes, that commission was actually there. But that commission, the money that the contractor supposed to use to finish the entire building, they incur it in the lecture theater. And they find it difficult to get support to do the event. So what we did was to approach them for they sent their team here, they submitted reports, and at a point they now allocated certain amount of money to finish the four projects. The three faculty and the selling building. But the money they sent to us, when, when the allocation they gave us, when I saw it. I look at it based on what is on ground now. It's not possible. And I don't want a situation where we apply that fund and the project will still remain abandoned. So we have to now ask all the contractors to submit cost of you know pending work. When they submitted it and we look at it, it was more than double the money the telephone allocated for us to fill the so what I did was to now say, okay, the total cost that these people submitted, I now use it along with the cost of each of them to get the percentage, which are now applied to the money that they found say they allocated. And I wrote to them and said, okay, the money you submitted, based on this percentage, this is the amount that will go to these people, this amount that I now have to write a full note to say, this money are highly inadequate to complete this project. And if we go ahead to use this money the way of spread it, none of this project will be completed. So they now say, okay, the only thing they can do is we should use the money for those projects that the money can accommodate. And looking at the amount, it will only go for faculty environmental design and the celebrity. So they took those one for us and wrote to us officially to use that for, for that. And we are already also submitting another proposal because the cost is not stable. We have to also ask for another cost estimate again based on the current situation and send to them so that we can pursue it for the two other faculty education and administration. So I think uh, we are on top of it. The only thing is that there are delay, there is some kind of delay uh, because of all other issues happening with the telephone. But once that is clear, I know you soon see uh, people working in your building to finalize on that. Then for faculty of computing, the allocation for 2024, from Telephone, we have dedicated it to build faculty of computing. <laughs> so, and I know the fiscal planning must have contacted 
the day so that we want the user department to be involved in the design or whatever. So we have done that and uh, we are going to pursue all the process to conclusion. I know it's not easy the way the faculty is operating now. We have to bear with the system and I know one day it will be uh, history. So we know about that. The other aspect is the staffing situation. I know we have new programs in the department now. Uh, even in the Faculty of Education, we have new programs. And even some of them that are there, uh, the staff are not uh, enough. But we know what is going on about our IPPIs. Even with the pronouncement that uh, we are going to be off IPPIs in December, I think up to April. Is the IPPIs, uh, I don't know whether, me, that's, is IPPIs that pay my salary? I don't know for others. But for this May, we don't know also whether they are the one to pay. So, but we are thinking between now and July. We know we met with the minister and uh, the province to allow us to be on our own very soon. But uh, you know, sometimes where ASU uh, comes in, <laughs> you have to be very careful to take immediate decision. Because when the minister invited us, ASU were invited us. And they raised an observation that if you remove university now, there are pending uh, issues. Responsibility allowance, who pay? Who will pay that one? So, and, uh, and it's true. Because if you remove us now, many people, we are HOD days, and they didn't finish their tenure, they didn't pay their responsibility allowance, there is record. And uh, when ASU now bring their request, which money do you have in the university to pay them? So we now ask the minister to see how they will resolve that. Because if not, the moment the university is off, that will be the end. And uh, there will be crisis in many universities. Because some ASU in some university, they are more stubborn than the other ones in other universities. <laughs> I know in our own case here we are managing ourselves, mm. but I know in some universities, uh, ASU and uh, management, they are just like uh, dog and cats. So, and you know, even here, it can come to dog and cat when the money matter comes. <laughs> because some people are here that when it comes to money, we don't joke with them. So, and that's why maybe that is one of the issues that is then because they have to rectify all this outstanding matter for them. The government have to look for money to see how to solve those things. But we, for appointment of senior academics, we are going to see how to do it for some of the new programs, from senior lecturer to professor, we are going to look at those aspects. I'm going to sit down with the dean of faculty of computing and also the dean of faculty of education. We look at priority areas. And we have to bring in senior academic first to come and prepare ground for how we are going to recruit the younger ones when the state is set for it. So, and uh, I know something happened in the uh, Faculty of Education on the issue of teaching uh, practice and our friends strongly against it. And in fact, there is a staff I talked to. One nice like that, but I'm here to tender apology for the way I talk to the son. Uh, because I'm, I'm doing that because of your dean came to defend you, and the way they didn't talk, I was actually touched that uh, if somebody that is putting all his all her efforts into the system. If you talk to like that by the vice chancellor, it means I'm demoralizing the, the staff. And I don't want to do that. So uh, that's why I say I'm telling apology. I know what the staff must have gone to. But when I talk like that, even myself with me, I say, Kai, this, this staff will not sleep well. <laughs> so, but I think now that uh, the staff may not even want me to know who 
she is, she is one of us. So in any case, uh, your dean has come and has explained all the matter to me. It's just a uh, kind of disconnect between faculties and the office of the bossa. But we are already handling that aspect. What I just want is whatever information we are giving to faculty, make sure we reach out to students also. They should be aware. Because when they are not aware, they can carry out or give out certain information that may dent our image. So I want to thank all of you uh, for giving me your time. I think uh, I've talked for less than one hour. <laughs> I think the vice chancellor deserves a better round of applause. So it is very rare to find a senior colleague apologizing to support me, but we've seen a special secretary apologizing for a comment he made. I think he deserves a better round of applause. Of leadership. We thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. I think it's time for comments.